John chapter 10. Let's uh, ask the Lord to speak to us as we dig into his word. Or that is indeed our prayer that as we open your word, as we read it, as we study it, as we just discuss it, Lord, that your spirit will just speak to our hearts and lives. And Lord, take the truth of your word and that we might, the spirit might apply it to our lives and that we might live it out throughout the week. We commit ourselves to that. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are our good shepherd. And uh, we just want to hear your voice and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you remember the movie back in the early 90s entitled Groundhog Day? Anybody remember that movie? Yeah. Starring Bill Murray and Andy McDowell. Bill Murray portrays a cynical weatherman named Phil who travels with his producer, Rita, and his cameraman, Larry, to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, I think it is, for the annual coverage of Groundhog Day. And so he wakes up on February 2nd, Groundhog Day, at 6 o'clock in the morning to his alarm clock to a tune, I Got You, Babe. And at the end of the day, he goes through the day and he interviews people, he talks to different people and so forth. At the end of the day, he gives a report, kind of a lackluster report. He wasn't so excited about this assignment. But he gives a report on Punxsutawney Phil, the groundhog, and all the festivities of the day there in Punxsutawney. And then at the end of the day, he tries to leave town, right? But a snowstorm comes, and he's stuck in this little town. So he goes back to his motel, sleeps another night, wakes up the next morning, and wakes up about the same time, 6 o'clock, to the same tune, I got you, babe. And he found, finds out that he is reliving the exact same day. All the events of Groundhog Day all over again. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And then the next day, the same thing. And the next, and the next, and the next. And he's trapped in this time loop that's forcing him to literally relive Groundhog Day repeatedly. You know, as you read through the Gospels, you ever feel like you're reading the same story over and over and over again? You know, kind of like, been there, done that? That's kind of what our story is like today. In John's Gospel, it almost feels like, like, John, like, like Jesus is reliving the same story or similar events over and over and over again. It kind of goes like this. He does a miracle where he teaches in a temple or a crowd. Pharisees confront him. Jesus makes a claim about his identity. Uh, sometimes veiled, sometimes not so veiled. The Pharisees then accuse him of blasphemy or being demon-possessed. Jesus rebukes them. They try to arrest him. He escapes. And you kind of see that a few different times. Not all of those portions of it, but at least some of that many times. I think that John is actually very intentional in recounting and repeating these stories. Because his theme is, you remember his theme? Of course you do. Believe in Jesus. Believing in Jesus. And so he is repeatedly, constantly contrasting the unbelief of the Pharisees with the belief or the faith of Jesus' followers. The stories are similar, but they have different twists, little different events sometimes, and some additional nuances of truth as well. So today, I've just entitled this message, Another Day, A Similar Story. John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. Let's read the whole account first, and we kind of get the big picture. Then we'll come back and, and look at it in, in sections. Beginning in John 10, verse 22. Then came the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus, Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? You are the Christ. Tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you didn't believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. 
Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If you called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said, I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. So we start off, and we see another celebration. Another celebration. This time it's called the Feast of Dedication. We call that today, the Jews call it today, Hanukkah. It's not actually one of the biblical feasts prescribed by God in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus. But it is certainly a day, a, a, a celebration for the Jews in the first century and still today in the 21st century. So let me just give you a little bit of background of, of Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication. It's actually a commemoration of the purification, the rededication of the temple by a guy named Judas Maccabeus in 165 BC. What had happened, uh, this Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes, absolutely hated the Jews. He despised them, and he was doing everything he could. He had gone down to Egypt to attack Egypt, and Egypt had defeated him. So then he went back up to Jerusalem and, and was fighting the, the Jews, and, and he was doing everything he could to just pretty much wipe them out. And for instance, he banned possessing a copy of the Torah, scriptures. He outlawed circumcision. If you circumcised the baby, you would be killed. He turned the temple into a house of prostitution, and he desecrated the temple altar by offering pigs, unclean animals that were just unheard of to, to offer in a, in a temple. But he offered these pigs to the Greek god Zeus on the temple altar. Under Antiochus, 80,000 Jews were killed and an equal number were sold as slaves. Then came a revolt, a revolt by a handful, a small band of Jewish people led by uh, Judas Maccabeus, called the Maccabean Revolt. And after a few skirmishes, they were able to eventually overthrow Antiochus. They reclaimed the temple. They dedicated it, purified it, and dedicated it to God on the 25th day of Kislev, which is in our month of December. It's actually been said and been told that when the temple was purified, the great seven-branched menorah was relit, the candelabra there in the temple, and there, but there was only enough oil to keep it burning for one day. But it miraculously lasted for eight days until new oil had been properly prepared. So that's why today Hanukkah is observed for eight days, because of the eight days that this candelabra miraculously continued to, to burn. And it's also referred to as the Festival of Lights. Now, this feast is in the winter months, December, normally, three months after the Feast of Tabernacles. And so, to get the picture of what's going on here in John chapter 10, the last half of John 10, the half we're looking at today, actually takes place two to three months after the first half of the book of John. Uh, of John chapter 10. And so, but even though it's another day, two months later, very similar story. Very similar. Here in this case, Jesus is walking in the temple, particularly in Solomon's colonnade, which is a covered courtyard on the temple grounds. And, and since it's winter time, that's why they're under this covered area. Many people are gathered under Solomon's colonnade as well. And they're gathering around to listen. And so we see a similar confrontation then in verse 24. The Jews gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? For the Christ, tell us plainly. Now that little phrase, gathered around, kind of, in our translation, makes it sound like a friendly gathering of interested parties. Hey, are you really the Messiah? Tell us, would you? Uh, but the truth is that it's a word that literally means can literally be translated surrounded or encircled 
And in this case, most likely, certainly with hostile intent. And so they asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? How long do you keep us in suspense? We want to know. Just make it clear. Think about it for a minute. This is just another confrontation in a long string of confrontations. There was a confrontation at the cleansing of the temple in John chapter 2. Confrontation after healing the blind man in John chapter 5. Confrontation over the bread of life. Confrontation at the feast of the tabernacle. There's another one over in John chapter 8. The woman caught in adultery. Another confrontation over the, Jesus declaring to be the light of the world. Another one after healing the blind man in John chapter 9. Another confrontation after he said, I am the good shepherd in the first half of chapter 10. And now this confrontation at the Feast of Dedication. They asked Jesus to clearly state if he is in fact the Christ. The Christ is the Greek word for a literally anointed one. Hebrew would translate it. Uh, Hebrew is Messiah. So are you the Messiah is what they want to know. See, Jesus has spoken in a lot of metaphors. He's the bread, the living water, the light, the good shepherd. Come on, tell us, are you the Messiah? So they ask him clearly. Now let me ask you, do you think they really want to know if he's the Messiah? Probably not. Or do you think they might be looking for a reason to arrest him? That's more likely. Go ahead, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? If he does, boom, we're arresting him. Why? Because he wasn't acting the way that they expected the Messiah to act. He wasn't a conquering king like they were expecting. So, another confrontation, which leads then to another claim by Jesus in verses 25 through 30. He says, I did tell you, Jesus said, that you didn't believe. Miracles I do in my Father's name, speak for me. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. You notice, Jesus didn't fall into their trap, did he? He never came right out and said, I am the Messiah. Why do you think he didn't do that? He knew the intent of their hearts. They didn't really want to know. They were just looking for a reason to arrest him. But I think it's interesting. He starts off and he says, I have told you and you didn't believe. So we might ask the question, when did Jesus tell him? And what did he tell them, and, and, and when? Well, if you read back in the book of John, all these previous chapters, there are many times he told them many different things. He said, I am the one who came from heaven. Chapter 6, I do what my Father in heaven tells me to do. Chapter 5, I'm the giver of life. I am from the Father. The Father sent me. Chapter 8, before Abraham, I was. I'm the Son of Man. Chapter 9, I will rise from the dead. And the bread of life, the light of the world, I'm the door, and the good shepherd. He's told them many things. Granted, a lot of metaphors, but he's told them many times. And so the problem here wasn't that Jesus hasn't been clear. The problem is that they are blinded by their hard hearts. Jesus simply knew that nothing he said would ever convince them that they would never believe in him. You see, they were looking for a, a different kind of Messiah. Looking for that warrior conqueror who would overthrow Rome. But that's not the kind of Messiah Jesus was. Yes, he's going to come back at the second coming as a warrior conqueror and will conquer all the armies of the world, but not, not this place. This time he came to conquer sin and to conquer Satan by dying on a cross to save mankind, not to conquer Rome. So he's a different kind of Savior. He came to give his life for the salvation of mankind. They didn't understand that. They didn't like that. They, they were just blinded by their hard hearts. So Jesus rebukes their unbelief. But then he speaks again of his sheep who believe in him. And he makes two very bold statements that pretty much leave it very clear who he is. The first statement he makes in verse 28, he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now when we talk about these verses, and we're going to do this later. But when we talk about these verses, we tend to focus on the eternal life and eternal security that is talked about in these verses, and, and rightfully so. But I think there's more to this claim than, than 
just means to die. Think about it a bit. Who's the giver of life? Whether it's physical life or spiritual life, eternal life, who's the one who gives life? God is the only one who can give life, eternal life, spiritual life. And yet Jesus says that he gives his followers, his sheep, life, eternal life. Now, you remember your high school algebra? The basic, simple algebraic formulas, right? You remember those? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, right? Let's apply that here. If God is the one who gives eternal life, and eternal life is given by Jesus, then Jesus must be God, right? Do you think the Pharisees taught that? I don't know. I suspect they probably did. But just in case they missed it, Jesus makes another claim, very plain. Second claim he says is, I and my Father are one. He may not have pointedly said, I am the Messiah. He did that to the woman at the well and the blind man that he healed in John chapter 9, but not to the Pharisees. But now he concludes with an even bolder, more provocative statement than saying, I am the Messiah. He says, I and my Father are one. Now the primary creed or doctrinal statement of Judaism, the Hebrew faith, comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our... Shema comes from the word hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, Yahweh, is one. And Jesus now says, I and my Father are one. The word one here is actually neuter rather than masculine. So he's not saying we are the same person. He's saying we are one essence. We are one nature. So this statement clearly speaks of the unity between God the Father and God the Son. The Father and the Son are two distinct persons rather than one person, but they are one in essence, one in nature. So Jesus here is clearly claiming to be God, to be deity, to be equal with God the Father, to be God himself. There's no doubt about his claim here. Which leads then to a similar charge by the Pharisees. Verses 31 through 33. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. Why would they want to stone him? But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father, for which, these, for which of these miracles do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. You see, Jesus, by this statement, I and my Father are one, really leaves these Jews, the Pharisees, with only two options. Either believe Jesus or declare him a blasphemer. They chose blasphemy over belief. Again, Pharisees have leveled several charges against Jesus in the past. They charged him with breaking the Sabbath. They charged him, they've accused him of being illegitimate. They called him a Samaritan, a half-breed. They accused him of being a raving lunatic, demon-possessed, in league with, with Satan. At the end of chapter 8, they accused him earlier of, being, of blasphemy and picked up stones to stone him. And now again, another charge of blasphemy. So Jesus responds in verse 32, I have shown you many good works, many miracles from the Father. The implication being that these miracles demonstrate the truthfulness of his claims. If he would not God, he wouldn't be able to do these miracles. But because he's doing these miracles, it demonstrates the truthfulness of his claim to be equal with the Father. And so they are accusing him of blasphemy, and they're ready to start throwing stones to execute Jesus for blasphemy. Well, that leads to another challenge by Jesus in verses 34 through 39. Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are God's. If you call them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? 
Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Okay? So he rebukes their lack of faith and challenges them really along two lines. Believe God's word and believe my works. First he says, believe the word of God. And he starts off here in verses 34 through 36 by referring to a scripture passage in Psalm chapter 82, verse 6. Where we read, if you turn back there, you would read basically, uh, well, you, basically what he says is, are you familiar with a passage in the Torah where humans are called gods? In that passage in Psalm 82, the psalmist references human judges who are carrying out a divine function by dispensing judgment and even though these Old Testament judges are mere humans and are uh, abusing their office, in fact, God still refers to them as gods, little g, of course, because they are representatives of the God, the true God. And so if the Bible calls these mere humans gods, then what's wrong with the Son of God being called God. This is a, what's called a, a logical argument from the lesser to the greater. If this is true, this lesser thing, then certainly this greater thing is true. So basically, if it's okay for in Israel's history for mere mortals to be called gods, how much more so is it legitimate for the Son of God, God incarnate, to be called God? Then in verses 37 through 38, he appeals again to his works. If my works are not from the Father, then you're right in not believing me. If they are from the Father, then I challenge you. Believe in me also. As supposed men of God, religious leaders that these Pharisees are, you'd think they'd be able to connect the dots, wouldn't you? To, to, to just follow the evidence to the logical conclusion that in fact he is God. Unfortunately, they their hearts are hardened, and their minds are just blinded by their own pride, so much so that they can't even see the truth standing right in front of their faces. Jesus. Truth. They can't even see it. You know, there's a lot of people in America just like that today, aren't there? They're set in their ways, blinded by pride, convinced of the lies that the world is feeding them all the time. And the truth is that no matter how logical your apologetic arguments might be to convince them of the truth of Christianity, some of them will just never be convinced, no matter how logical the arguments are. And so I suggest it's probably best most of the time, rather than debating with people about Christ, much better to simply stick with the truth of the gospel, the simple truth of the gospel, and let the Holy Spirit do the convicting, rather than us trying to argue people into the kingdom of God. I have found in my experience that it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. For instance, Mormon or Holy Witness comes to the door, person of their cult, you ever try to argue with them, debate with them? It never works. Don't bother. Just share the simple truth of the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. He's the one who convicts, not me, not you. So just give him, give the Holy Spirit the truth of the gospel to work with. Well, that leads to a similar conclusion in verses 39 through 41. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. And here he stayed, and many people came to him, and they said, Oh, John never performed a miraculous sign. All that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. So almost an identical conclusion to John chapter 8, the end of John chapter 8. The Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus. Jesus escaped and slipped away through the crowd and left. Then he went down to the Jordan Valley with his disciples. Why? Because even though he's nearing the time of his death, his mission with the disciples is not yet completed. He still has some training to do. He's still training them to carry on the mission 
of sharing the gospel and spreading the good news to the world. And so he takes them down there, he ministers to them, he trains them some more, talks to them some more. And as they're down there, other people come. Of course, wherever Jesus goes, people find him. And they come and listen, and the text says that many believe in him as well. So, another day. A very similar, very familiar story. Another feast. Another confrontation with the Pharisees. Another counterclaim by Jesus. Some listeners believe but the Pharisees' hearts are hard as the stones they picked up to stone them with. But with Jesus' counterclaims in this passage, we we'll learn some very significant truths about God's sheep, and about salvation, and about our eternal security in Christ as well. So let me just share with you five, going back to, to verses 26 through 30, five truths about God's sheep. First truth is this, God's sheep believe in the shepherd. Verse 26, he's talking to the Pharisees. He said, you do not believe because you are not my sheep. The entire point of John's gospel is believing in Jesus. Believing Jesus is the only way to enter God's kingdom. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only entrance into the sheepfold. God's sheepfold. Believing in Jesus is the only path to forgiveness of sin, to, to restore relationship with God. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to pass from death unto life, to eternal life, an abundant life. And so, it, again, it's this contrast between the unbelief of the Pharisees. You didn't believe because you're not my sheep with the faith of, the, of his sheep who do believe in the shepherd. So that's where it all starts. It starts with faith in Jesus Christ. The second truth is that God's sheep listen to their shepherd. Verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. The sheep know their shepherd's voice. They can distinguish their shepherd's voice from other shepherds and from thieves and false shepherds. So God's sheep know the voice of their shepherd, Jesus Christ. Remember in the previous chapter, I think it was chapter 8, we learned that what Satan's native language was? What's Satan's native language? Lying, right? Lies. Well, Jesus' native language is truth. Particularly, the truth of Scripture. So the more we know the truth of Scripture, the more we will listen to His voice and recognize His voice and be able to distinguish His voice from all the other voices in the world and from Satan's voice, from all the lies that are out there. So we need to listen to His voice by learning the truth of God's Word. Then we will hear His voice. But He also speaks sometimes with the still, small voice the Holy Spirit. The reason we don't hear that is because we are busy, 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 aren't we? In order to hear the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit, we need to slow down. Be still. It's a still, small voice. It's not a busy, small voice. It's a still, small voice. We need to slow down in order to listen. God's sheep listen to the shepherd. Third, God's sheep follow their shepherd. I know them, and they follow me. The good shepherd cares for his sheep. He feeds them, protects them, he comforts them, he guides them. And knowing that the good shepherd has their best interest in mind, sheep then follow their shepherd. Are you following the shepherd? Or do you tend to wander off like some sheep do and get lost? True sheep follow their shepherd. Even when the going gets rough, they hang in there. They keep following. Fourth, God's sheep receive eternal life from their shepherd. I give them eternal life, verse 28, and they shall never perish. This isn't temporary life, okay? This is eternal life. This isn't life until we blow it. Because we're all, we all blow it, okay? This isn't just spiritual life on earth. This is eternal life, forever life. From the moment we trust Christ, place our faith in Christ, the minute we die, and on beyond into eternity. This is eternal life. And then Jesus says, and they shall never perish. The word never in the Greek is made up of two negatives. Who may. Both are negatives. 
Now, in our language, we don't put two negatives together. But in the Greek, they did to, in order to make it, to emphasize it. Literally, it's never, certainly not, by no means, no way, no possible way, will you ever lose your eternal life. See, once you have eternal life, it is eternal. It's forever. It's invincible. And no one can take it away from you, not even Satan himself. God's sheep receive eternal life in their shepherd. And then finally, God's sheep are secure in their shepherd. Verses 28 through 30. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. We call this eternal security. Our place in the flock of God is safe and secure. No matter how insensitive, how disobedient, how fearful, fearful we can be, our salvation is still secure. Now, don't get me wrong, okay? That is not to suggest that once you're saved, you can go on living however you want, okay? That's not it at all. If you're continuing to live in willful sin, if that characterizes your life, you probably need to ask a very serious question. Am I really saved or not? Do I have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ? Because true sheep follow the shepherd. But when saved, we are saved forever. Our salvation is eternally secure. Why? Very simply, because salvation is a work of God. From beginning to end. It's not my work. Nothing I can do to save myself. But it's God's work. All the way from Jesus' death on the cross, to the conviction of sin and faith in Christ, to salvation and forgiveness to, uh, of sin, to glorification in heaven when I die. It's all God's work all along the way. If salvation was based on me and my work, no way. It would be rather insecure. But because it's a work of God, and nobody is greater than God, my life is secure. Jesus puts it this way. Nobody can snatch us out of God's hand. Neither out of Jesus' hand nor out of God's hand. I like that. It's like double security, okay? I place myself in Jesus' hand right there, okay? And that's pretty secure. But just in case, and there's no just in case, really, because he is God. But then Jesus and I are placed in the Father's hand. So there's double protection there, okay? No one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. Let me illustrate. Very carefully illustrate the divine truth, but let me try Sometimes, in cooler weather, I take my two-year-old grandson, Lincoln, for a walk around the block, okay? Or a walk partway down and back. Or sometimes we'll go to a store with Bart and, and, and we'll get out of the car. And obviously, when we get out of the car, we always hold his hand, right? Well, so sometimes, as we're walking, I'll just stick my finger out and Lincoln will grab my finger and hold it. His hand's not very big, so that's about all he can handle, okay? His finger. So sometimes it gives them a little sense of security and a sense of where we're going. But other times, if we're in a parking lot with our other car, if we're walking on a sidewalk where there is traffic, I don't just let him hold my finger, but I hold his hand instead. Okay? Is there a difference? You bet there's a difference. If he's holding my finger, well, he can let go at any time and wander off, right? And he's pretty good at doing that. <laughs> but if I'm holding his hand, guess what? I am a lot bigger and a lot stronger than my two-year-old grandson, and no amount of squirming is going to get, let, him, let him loose. If there's danger around, I'm holding his hand. He's not holding mine. And that's security. Well, we are secure in our Father's hand, in Jesus' hand, like that double protection. We are safe and secure in the shepherd's hand. We're clutched securely in Jesus' hand and then in the Father's hand. Are you one of his sheep? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? If you have, then you are enjoying that security in Christ, of eternal life, and no one and nothing can take that away from you. You are safe and secure in the hands of Jesus, your good shepherd, and in the hands of a great and an awesome God. But the question remains, as you walk this Christian life, we're still sheep, aren't we? So are you listening to your shepherd's voice? Are you following your shepherd day by day? Let's pray.
Thank you, Lord, for your word. <clears throat> just the challenge of your word. I just thank you for the security that we have in Jesus Christ, for the eternal life that we have through Christ. Lord, my prayer is that everyone here today has truly trusted you as Savior and is indeed following you. But Lord, if there's someone here today who has not trusted you as Savior, I just pray that before they leave this room, they might talk to me or someone and just know for sure that Jesus is in fact their Savior. That they're a part of God's kingdom. They're in the sheepfold. Father, again, just thank you for your love and your grace. We just want to just close by affirming that we are your sheep and we want to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you've never known, never placed your faith in Christ, I would invite you after the service to just talk to me or, or find someone. There's lots of people around here that can just tell you how you can know Jesus Christ and, and become one of his sheep. A member of that sheep and have that eternal salvation. Okay? Let's stand again and let's just affirm our following of Christ. Let's stand this thing. I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs>